Today I'll talk to you about one particular um, you know, project, or in particular I'll talk to you what we do in our lab, what Microsoft is doing a bit more broadly in uh, mixed reality. Um, I'm actually not part of Microsoft Research, I'm part of uh, the actual product team that works on mixed reality, uh, but we do definitely also do uh, research. Um, so maybe first, why mixed reality? Why are, are we spending so much effort? Why are many uh, in the industry spending a lot of effort on mixed reality? Well, if you look at personal computing devices, first generation is this laptop here in front of me. Um, it's a device that is great at manipulating digital information, but it's mostly disconnected from the world uh, around it. Um, then, um, the second generation uh, of um, personal computing device is a, is a device like this. It's a worse computer in many ways, but however, it's one that's always with you, that's in the world with you. Um, it has some awareness, uh, say GPS, for example, so it can help you navigate the world, as, as an example, and adjust along the way and, and kind of uh, facilitate that. If you go beyond that, um, to the goal with this third generation of personal computing devices is now devices that have a lot more awareness of the environment uh, around you, uh, they can see what you see. They can also sense what you are doing. They can, um, they can essentially combine all of that together with digital information, bring the digital information, the real world, bring all of that together, and es essentially help you much better in whatever task uh, you are trying to do. Okay, so we're just at the beginning of that. Let me show a quick video here. Um, that actually Microsoft HoloLens well. brings holograms into your real world. Using transparent lenses, spatial sound, and an understanding of your environment, Holograms look and sound like they're actually part of the world around you. That is mixed reality. With Microsoft HoloLens, holograms are viewed through the holographic frame centered in the middle of your view. This preserves your peripheral vision so you can move freely and connect and collaborate with people around you. Holograms in mixed reality don't block out what you can see and hear. This enables you to engage with digital content and tools alongside the objects in your real world. Holograms can be world-locked in a physical location, so you can walk around them, or they can travel with you. You can even hear them in 3D with spatial sound. Microsoft HoloLens is the world's first fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer. With the mixed reality experience of HoloLens, you can stay in the real world and interact with real people as you simultaneously explore 3D in 3D. Okay, so that's, that was actually HoloLens 1, if, if, if some of you know this. HoloLens 2 is essentially the same kind of device, but another uh, a stage further. Um, so what I want to do is show you a little bit uh, what actually has to happen under the hood. All the AI, all the computer vision that has to happen under the hood to make all of this possible. So first, you have of course a normal camera. So there's a normal photo camera or video camera there, which can be used for communication with other humans. Um, so that's a camera, that's when it goes on for privacy reasons, there's a privacy light that goes on, etc. cetera. Um, that's a camera that allows a number of scenarios where other people can help you, uh, assist you in doing a particular task. But under the hood, there's much more going on. So we have uh, all these additional sensors. There's a stereo rig here, so like, or we have two eyes to see the world. Um, HoloLens also has these two central cameras, see essentially overlapping, can directly build themselves a 3D uh, 3D map of the world. There's additional peripheral cameras. This is really important so that if you, it's a head-worn device, you can quickly turn your head so that it can actually keep tracking the world even you know, when you're quickly uh, moving around. Um, so why do we need to track the world? Uh, we actually use both visual and then also inertial IMU, uh, inertial me measurement units, fuse those signals together uh, to get a very precise, very low latency estimate of the user motion. Now why is that? Well, it's because if you just have the device on, and you display something on the two screens here, then you would just see an object here, but as you move your head, it would move with you. Okay, so if you actually want to place an object virtually in the scene, and when you move your head, it means the display needs to know the relative motion to apply the inverse relative motion uh, to, the, to what gets displayed to, uh, to the graphics. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in practice, it's actually, not only you have to compute that from those images, you actually have to predict forward, because if we only, you know, a few tens of milliseconds behind, people will see the difference. Um, in VR, they will get sick. In AR, you will just have the impression everything is a bit floating. Okay? So to be able to cope with that, um, we actually need to predict forward, and then we actually also use, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, um, there's actually some hardware built in HoloLens here in a chip um, that is actually hiding that latency by doing a small image correction. I'll get to that in a, in a second. 
Um, there's also another camera built in, and that's that camera over there. Um, and it, um, it's essentially a depth camera. Um, it can be used in two modes. Actually, the biggest constraint factor on HoloLens to build it is not so much the battery, uh, which is in the back here, it's not so much the battery capacity. It's really, this device has to stay cool when it's on your head, so it shouldn't heat up and become uncomfortable. Your phone, when you do AR or any kind of really expensive stuff on the, on the phone in compute, your phone is heating up a lot. In your hand, that's still okay, but something that's you know, resting on your forehead would be highly uncomfortable uh, if it would get too hot. These are actually chimneys to help cool it down, and here there's a, a cooling plate also in the, in, in the back, a vapor chamber, actually. Um, okay, so we have a depth camera. It has two modes. One is actually focused in uh, and looks at the environment, um, beams energy up to a few meters, uh, does this type of things. It builds a 3D model of the environment. Now you can ask, it's augmented reality, why do we need a model of the environment? Well, if you want to place holograms in a natural way that they interact with the physical world, um, then you need a 3D model. For example, if I place a hologram here and then you move around and the hologram should be occluded, well, if you reconstruct the environment, you can actually do the proper occlusion relationships. Um, you can also, of course, use what you computed in the background, uh, essentially accumulate that and build a 3D model uh, of the whole environment. Um, do semantic analysis on this and essentially build a floor plan automatically just as a byproduct of walking around with the whole ends in that environment. Um, at the same time, there's a second mode which is much wider field of view. Um, and where you actually detect the hands. This is now, the other one was at a few hertz. This is happening at 45 hertz. It's actually tracking your hand. It uses a DNN inference core that's also built in HoloLens in a special ASIC to actually be able to detect the hands and detect different key points on the hand. And with, from that initialize uh, um, a detailed geometric hand tracking model. It's a depth camera, so it can actually then use a geometric refinement algorithm to get 45 times per second a very detailed pose of your hand and enable scenarios like the one here at the bottom, where you just interact um, and uh, can manipulate virtual holograms in the same way as you would manipulate real world objects. And so you don't really have to train to use mixed reality, you can just essentially do as you would do with real objects and it just works. Okay? You can see a small offset that actually has to do with the fact that the image is rendered for one of the eyes and is displayed on top of this image, so this offset is what you see uh, in the images. Um, beyond that, there's also eye tracking built in. These two little cubes here, are actually cameras that look at your eyes. Along, around the rim of the lenses, there's um, small L infrared LEDs that reflect on your eyes and allow to precisely compute where your eye is. Then you can find the iris and find precisely where you're looking. Okay? This is also used not only for scenarios like this one here, uh, where you can read and as you read along, it automatically scrolls, um, but also for um, for iris recognition, so for uh, biometric authentication when you wear the device, and actually also very important to calibrate the display to know exactly how far apart your eyes are. This is called interpupillary distance. It's critical because if you render it at the wrong distance, you render the two images, assuming a different distance between your eyes, you actually get something inconsistent. You will see everything too big or too small because that's how we perceive depth. Now we have another way to also perceive depth if we move around then you actually also perceive depth. And if you know, the holograms look different when you move than when you perceive it in 3D, there's some, you, know, you will get uncomfortable. Okay. Um, there's also microphone arrays and so on. Uh, I won't talk about that. Uh, now, how is it possible to run all of those real-time computer vision you know, without a big GPU all the time you know, consistently to be able to just provide you these intuitive experiences? Well, it's because there's essentially Microsoft had to develop, the, develop this ASIC which is a lot of DSPs that run all of these computer vision uh, algorithms, a DNA inference chip, um, and then also this um, so-called depth-based LSR uh, block, which is essentially an image-based warp that happens. The images, um, so the device computes where it thinks it is. Actually, it computes forward, it predicts forward based on a filter where you will be you know, 20, 50 milliseconds in the future. You ask the GPU to render the image correctly from that viewpoint, uh, that's, in, that's in the back here, it gets, comes back to the front, ready to go to the display, it reads out the latest IMU measurements, makes a small correction uh, by observing the discrepancy between the prediction and what you actually measure, uh, and essentially corrects that, and that way hides the latency and brings it practically to within 10 milliseconds, which is, if you're below 10 milliseconds, you actually cannot perceive this discrepancy. And so suddenly everything looks like it's rigidly attached to the environment, although you know, it's actually just faked in a sense, right? Um, of course, also a classical processor, 
uh, in the back here, so that's where all the applications run. It's also, in a sense, privacy by design. All of the raw sensor data that gets collected is actually only accessible on the processor in the front, where applications don't have access to, and the application processor in the back actually only gets access uh, to, uh, to the signals, you know, to essentially the, the, mo the motion, for example, or where you are looking and so on, but doesn't get access to the raw uh, sensor data. Um, Okay, what are the applications? Well, of course, you know, these kind of uh, um, boardroom meetings where you discuss a big project. Um, you can all see the same holographic uh, projection, for example, or you can also bring that back on site. So those are some of the example applications. Um, if you have really high-end models, um, the fact that we have hardware to high latency, we actually also leverage that to be able to not only render, you know, in the back here on the GPU, the small GPU in the back of the device, but we can actually also hide more latency and send requests all the way to the cloud, render very high-end models there on, on high-end GPUs, and then stream it back to the device, um, and hide in the order of 100 milliseconds, uh, but still have a completely interactive uh, experience, but now with hundreds of millions or even billions of polygons. Um, okay. um, then the key applications today are of this type. One is to get assistance from an expert, so you're on site, you have to solve a problem, uh, but you don't have all the expertise, well, you call in the expert. The expert can see what you are seeing. The expert can place information in 3D in the world in front of you. It can actually point in 3D and say this button here, and it's, there's a, an arrow floating using the depth camera. It can actually be stabilized. It, it's actually placed in the world. So it's not a 2D annotation. You still have to look at a picture and interpret. No, it's actually the world that gets annotated in front of you. Uh, this is an example of uh, Mercedes maintenance um, uh, in the U.S. being done this way, essentially. Um, and then the other big scenario is a so-called guides scenario. This is a more, um, not a special case that happens, but it's more the, the standard case. It's a standard maintenance case or something like this. You can essentially build up as you build up, people you know, provide video tutorials online. Here it's actually a mixed reality 3D tutorial where things are a lot easier to understand because they directly appear on top of the machine that you have to maintain. It illustrates exactly not to be misunderstood uh, instructions. Um, now, there's still um, a lot of research that can actually add to these scenarios. That's one example of work um, that we do in the lab, uh, that we've done in the lab. Uh, this was published at CVPR, but essentially the idea here is to have this guides application uh, or HoloLens not only be able to display information and guide you through steps, but actually be able to also follow and understand if you are doing those steps correctly or not. Uh, and so for that, we need to be able to do action recognition uh, from, from data here. Okay? Uh, here's a more practical example. Oops, sorry, too fast. Um, so, no, one more. Okay, sorry. Um, so here, see an example of how this could be applied. Um, here, um, person is essentially supposed to replace a cartridge, um, and essentially here, from the video, will automatically analyze uh, and see if the person is proceeding through the right steps. Uh, and so this automatically follows along, and then the tutorial can actually adaptively. Uh, play along also uh, if you wish, uh, you know, if you wish that. Um, so you see it goes through the different steps. And then um, here in this example, if the person makes a mistake, so opens the door here, but then after that actually grabs a new cartridge already, then the system detects that and say, hey, you know, you forgot a step here, you should first do that instead, right? So you can see how you can now help uh, people um, in, in uh, learning how to do tasks. For those of you that are doing research, uh, if you're interested in, in, in working in this space, uh, HoloLens has actually a specific research mode. You can switch a device in a mode where you can actually get access to the raw information. Now you have to switch a device in developer mode, research mode. You cannot upload um, you know, uh, those apps that you develop. You cannot just upload them to the store because of the risk of privacy. But for your own research, you can actually, um, you can actually uh, get access to all of the raw sensor data, raw depth maps, raw images, uh, et cetera, not from the eyes though, uh, but all the external facing sensors as well as at the same time still have access to the head tracking, the hand tracking, the eye gaze tracking, uh, and the color camera. So all the standard APIs are still available, but you can actually get all the raw data. So if you want to do egocentric computer vision, for example, in your research, a great tool uh, to do. Now a bit more controversial application. Um, this is actually also one, of, one of the use cases. Actually, um, the, the scenarios, so I explained to you how if you're in front of a machine, you're a technician, you have to repair a machine, how you can get help from this device. Uh, because it can give you information in a way that's not to be misunderstood and so on. Now, if you think forward, the most challenging place is places where you're in an emergency situation, you have to think through, you get a lot of information, 
uh, there might be a lot of information uh, there. You really need situational awareness um, because there's life and death uh, situations that, that you have to face. So in those cases, being able to train properly, train scenarios, and then also in the field be able to have access to that information is something that can really help reduce mistakes. Um, Army leaders so believe IVAS can make the difference between life and death. You have the opportunity to rehearse it 50 times before you actually go on on a real mission. I think it's going to save soldiers' lives. Okay, so this gives you an idea of what's possible. Now, think of this also for fire training, fire brigade training, for all of these type of scenarios. If you're really in emergency situations, being able to really have access to see things that you cannot see with your own eyes, but now, for example, for fire brigade, the heat, the temperature, from a thermal camera can be overlaid on the scene so you can see what's hot, for example. If behind the door there's fire, you can see this now through these type of systems. Another place where we're talking live death situations is, of course, also in the medical space. Um, here's an example of colleagues um, at the um, University of Zurich Balgrist uh, Hospital um, doing a, a world first um, here operation as a spine surgery operation uh, of a certain type. Uh, this is on a cadaver, but you'll also see images of the real uh, surgery uh, where essentially they use mixed reality to accelerate and to, be, to, you know, to reduce errors, um, to increase precision so that you don't have to try several times to insert a particular bar that you have to deform a certain way. You can measure all of this, verify all of this visually, and then uh, be much more effective uh, in carrying out uh, this procedure. We also do work there to be able to automatically track and analyze and so on and so on uh, in research. Now, one thing is a device. The other thing is really um, the complement is the cloud of this to give capability. One is in terms of communication, and I won't talk about that, but Microsoft is also working on Microsoft Mesh, uh, which is essentially about enabling devices to communicate um, and, and, um, uh, you know, and have telepresence, be able to have people that are not physically together still have a sense of presence uh, when they interact. That can be, as you see in this scenario, a person is physically there, another person is somewhere else, also with a mixed reality, augmented reality device, and then someone else is present as an avatar uh, when they're using a VR device, for example. Right? So you really can bring people together, bring over much more than just the audio and the visual, video channel, but a much more rich uh, representation of the person. Okay? Um, you can actually try this out in, in, uh, if you have a HoloLens uh, with the Microsoft Mesh app. Um, uh, what my team in Zurich is, is very much focused on is more these environment understanding capabilities. Um, in particular, this service, Azure Spatial Anchors, which is about being able to share and place information in the world, persist it there, and share it with others. Uh, as in this example here, for example, uh, where you see multiple people with multiple types of devices be able to have a common 3D object. And so when one person points, everybody sees the same thing in the same place. Okay? Um, we actually initially developed this, uh, the first place where this came out was this game, Minecraft Earth, which came out just before the pandemic, which was a terrible timing. Uh, but anyways, this was, um, this was me playing in Zurich, for example, with, an, with a phone, with an augmented reality uh, kind of game. And this was placed there and could be placed, you know, afterwards other people could come there and see things in the same place. Um, but of course, actually at Microsoft, uh, much more important at this point is really this kind of enabling these kind of scenarios that you see there f for devices like, like HoloLens, where you can have multiple people in the world, in a factory, in a, in a place like that, where you know, this device is not meant as a device to use at home or something like this, right? It's meant as a professional tool that you use in places where there's high added value to be able to get this expertise, right? Um, so scenarios like this where multiple people walk around across the factory, all of your IoT data, all of the sensors, all of this digital information, this layer of digital information that corresponds to the real world, but that typically is only accessible in the kind of control room or other places, now you want to bring all of that back to the thing. But to do that, you need essentially something that will glue together, that will align the digital world to the physical world. Okay, and that's really what we focused on. Another application of this uh, with Trimble, this is a special version of HoloLens um, that, uh, that is uh, integrated in the helmet. Uh, for hard hat environments uh, in construction. So they're also the plan of the construction and the actual construction. You want to make sure that those things correspond. You want to make sure that people don't make mistakes and build the window in the wrong place and, and stuff like that, which happens a lot, by the way, in construction. Um, and costs a lot to fix. Um, conceptually, what we do is something like this. Whole lens, just to operate, as I mentioned earlier, is essentially continuously mapping its environment in a small scale uh, where it's operating. Um, so the key is to bring that map to the cloud. Um, other person maps another part of the building and you keep going like this and after a while you essentially have covered everything. So the key is to bring that together in the cloud, assemble it, puzzle it back together essentially uh, and do that. Okay, so here's an example. This is actually Studio uh, A on the Microsoft campus. Uh, the video is going a bit funny there. So here's another example. We missed SBB so I want to show you a little bit of SBB anyways. 
Uh, this is the main train station in Zurich. Um, and then uh, there we worked together with, with, we went there at night, um, and together with people from SBB, walked around with whole lenses, um, just freely walked around in, in the whole, uh, across the whole station and the underground uh, shopping mall. And then here you can see actually all the trajectories that we worked. And all those points, they're not meant to be a nice 3D, you know, precise 3D reconstruction of the environment. They're meant to be visual key points that we can use as a visual reference to relocate ourselves in that environment. So as you go there another day and you want to navigate around, you can essentially find back your position and then uh, automatically and then get navigated around uh, or, you know, persist information. <coughs> Here's another example. Um, this is actually the, the new Microsoft, um, the commercial part of Microsoft at the Circle in, um, in Zurich. Um, which is near the airport, and so there's, we walked around the two floors where the offices uh, were in construction, and you can actually see we recorded with HoloLens, but we also recorded with the Spot Robot, as well as with um, uh, a Leica um, sensing device, and you could see different heights, and so the Spot is the lowest one, and then, you know, head mount and, and, and uh, hand uh, one device. At the same time as we do this, we also do research on are there ways that we can um, try to preserve privacy even more than we already do. So, for example, here on the left, you see a 3D model, which is the typical way you have these 3D feature points. They have descriptors with them. You can project that in the image, and if you, you compute the relation between a 3D model and the 2D image, and you can find your position precisely in that environment. But looking at a 3D model, it reveals a lot about the, 3D, about the scene that, that you're relocalizing into. Um, and actually, if you have those visual descriptors attached to it, you can even resynthesize images that very much look like the original images. So what we looked at is, is there a representation that we can develop that still allows exact 3D localization, but doesn't actually reveal the 3D structure of the scene? Um, and so that's what we did on the right. Um, we essentially, for every point, we forgot the exact position of the point. We drew a random 3D line through the point. And then that 3D line projected in the image, that line should still coincide with a, with a proper 2D point in the image. But it doesn't really reveal the 3D structure anymore. Instead of two constraints per point, we only have one constraint per point anymore, but we preserve the privacy. So that's one example. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this space. This is showing another example where we build a whole 3D reconstruction pipeline. Um, on the left, the classical one, where you can actually you see the type of inversion attacks we can carry out, and you can kind of recognize people in the pictures. And on the right, you see that there's no people visible. This is because the process we followed is now correctly preserving privacy, and so the inversion attacks cannot actually recuperate the appearance of people in the pictures. Okay? Then, uh, last thing is really the link between mixed reality and robotics. Uh, so people walk around in these environments, need to be localized continuously for uh, enabling mixed reality experiences and for giving them access to digital information. But robots very much operate in the same ways. They have sensors built in. They need to be localized to be able to get tasks and operate tasks autonomously. Um, and so um, you get these type of um, examples where here we just with a phone. So the person is in the world, they localize us with a phone. There's a robot at the end of the hallway. Uh, the person gives a target location uh, and it, uh, it operates. Um, and then you have a digital twin kind of on the right bottom side here. Okay. Here's another example. There's actually a, a Linux SDK to connect your robots to this Azure Spatial Anchor service. Uh, here you see Spot that will carry out essentially a mission autonomously. You see on the bottom here the, the map, actually the map that was merged automatically between Hollands, which is the higher tracks, head, head height, and the lower tracks, um, the uh, spot height. Uh, and so the person can essentially define a mission with Hollands, say um, spot should come every week and take a picture here, here, and here to you know, take pictures of sensors or particular equipment, make sure that everything's still in place. Uh, you place here things, um, and then spot can afterwards just autonomously carry this out. Um, and here, last example of what you can do in robotics. Uh, this is with a colleague, Stelian Koros at ETH, a uh, collaborative project between Microsoft and, and ETH, uh, where essentially you have a person wear a remote, uh, like a, a HoloLens, and then can essentially embody the robot through this. The hand tracking maps to the, uh, to the ABB robot here. Um, when he moves his head, you will see the stereo camera uh, on the small arm on top of uh, Spot will also move. Uh, and so what he sees in the lens, in the whole lens, is actually what the robot sees in the real world. And so that way the person can project presence and can act in the world as a remote uh, actor. So to conclude, mixed reality headsets have the potential to bring a lot more uh, user and task context to assist the user by observing the user action, understanding the environment, having at the same time access to the relevant digital information, have natural user interfaces, and also by being able to place pixel and information anywhere that it's relevant in the world in front of the user. Um, and uh, key questions are combining edge and cloud computing, in what way, what do you do where, 
uh, telepresence, being able to project the presence of a user remotely and also allow a user to access a place uh, remotely. A um, lot of interesting synergies between head-mounted displays, robotics, ambient sensing, and IoT devices. And um, last but not least, also really important to, in all of those aspects, to think about privacy always. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks for the talk. Just um, practical reasons. Do you think HoloLens will become personal device like iPhones or even smaller like your eyeglasses? Thank you. Um, not HoloLens itself. Like HoloLens now is really meant as a as a tool. Like it's 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 a you know sizable device with a lot of sensor, a lot of capabilities. But but I think the the, the question you were asking is is you know. Is a company like Microsoft also interested in building a device that essentially will more look like this form factor uh, and that we will all wear uh, day in, day out? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are working on it, uh, but you know, this is something that's a lo lot longer horizon. Um, if we could build it today, uh, if you know, others could build it today, it would be there. Uh, there's still a lot of challenges to do this. There's going to be interesting trade-offs in technology. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the next few years and see a lot of these things uh, starting to, to come out, but absolutely.